Hi, this is Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Uh, this is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We also do entrepreneurial things. And uh, today we have a really interesting couple, uh, Lauren Pierce and Spencer, Spencer Vanderkamp of Real Fresh. If you love fish, you're going to love this show. I'm telling you now. And, <laughs> and of course, uh, Mitch Ewan, and he will introduce them in a moment. But first, we're going to talk to our spokesman from Hawaiian Electric, uh, Peter Rosick, because what he's going to tell you is very important to a lot of people. Hi, Peter. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Jay. It's really, it is a very important message for a lot of people in Hawaii. Uh, as of uh, September 1st, we're going to start uh, resuming disconnections or non-payment of, uh, of the electric bills. And we know there are a lot of people who have uh, financial problems. Uh, we know that there may be, uh, they're continuing with possible additional closures and so forth. So it's really important that people contact Hawaiian Electric uh, if they can't make their their payments to avoid being dis being disconnected, which is not pleasant and it's not fun and it costs money to get reconnected. So uh, if you are unable to make your full payments by uh, September 1st, it's really important, and we're going to be saying this again and again, uh, come to hawaiianelectric.com uh, slash payment arrangement and uh, fill out a form there. It'll show you what you can do uh, there. It'll, it'll explain the various options that we have. Uh, we do have a number of options for stretching out payments. I mean, ultimately, everything's got to be paid for, but we understand a lot of people are not in a position to pay everything right away. So, uh, and, and we also have on our website uh, some places for people to look for help. Each county has a slightly different way of getting CARES money and other kinds of, of assistance. Uh, we also have a link to hawaiienergy.com, which is, you know, the great source for uh, ways to save energy, which is always good, but it is especially important right now why you can't uh, if you can't pay your bills so uh, you know it's a message we're going to be drumming uh very loud for the next really for the next four weeks or so because before between now and september 1st it's really important that people come to our website fill out a simple form about and make some kind of arrangement if we can't if we haven't heard from a customer we've got to assume that they're not going to pay their bill if they're deadbeat. Whether they are or not, we don't know, but we can't do anything until the customer contacts us and says, look, I can't make my full payment. Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to pay over a four month period, six month, whatever. And, you know, like everything else, if you're, if you're sincere and you make an effort, get in touch, uh, work something out. We're going to do everything we can to avoid putting you in difficulty with so many people home, of course, we don't want to cut anybody's power off. So um, what was the name of that site again, Peter? It is winelectric.com yeah. slash payment arrangement, all one word, payment arrangement. And uh, you'll find there that'll start you going for uh, links and things like that about how to deal with this. We have other sites that'll tell you where you could pay and all of these other things. But if you're gonna have a problem between now and September 1st paying your bills, hawaiianelectric.com slash payment arrangement is a really important site you need to visit. Or just go to the website hawaiianelectric.com and you'll find links to get you to that. But you got to let us know. That's the main thing. Well, there are in your memo that you sent, uh, your press release, I guess, um, you talked about other programs where people could, you know, get some help. Uh, right. Would, through the CARES program, the, the federal care program, in the city and county, in Maui County, in Hawaii County. Um, where do they go for that? Do you, do you list those uh, possibilities but on your those website? Those are on the site. Uh, you, that news release, which we sent out, is also on the website. You can link to that on the very first page, and that will tell you everything that I'm telling you uh, even more clearly. But uh, so we have those links to the to ways. Each county is a little different, as I said. So you got to pay attention if you're on Maori, Big Island, or Oahu, how to get in touch with these people. And there are other, you know, there are various charitable organizations and so forth. But, uh, you know, so there are ways to get help. 
There are ways to avoid getting disconnected. And it just it's going to take some initiative by the people who are uh, having a problem making payments. Okay, well, I hope you'll come back between now and the end of August anyway to talk about this some more. Make sure we, everybody knows about it. We absolutely will. Anytime, anytime we can get a platform like this, we'll be, you'll see us on you know, the other kind of television. You'll see us on, you'll hear us on the radio. We're, we are making a 100% effort to make sure nobody says, oh, gee, I didn't know I was going to be disconnected. That'd yeah. be the really, that'd be worst thing for all of us. We hate to do that. It's the worst last resort. Uh, so we will do everything we can from our end to help people who are having a problem. We all know people in that situation. Oh, so. <clears throat> That's Peter Rusek, uh, the spokesman for Hawaiian Electric, and that is Hawaiian Electric, Hawaii's electric company. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Peter. Okay, we're going we're gonna to move now, um, and we're going to go to our main show. We have uh, Lauren Pierce and Spencer Vandekamp, and Mitch Ewan is going to give us a little background so we can understand them and what they are doing and the excitement of their project. Anyway, we're really lucky to have uh, Lauren and Spencer here. They're part of the uh, UH uh, Venture uh, Competition, which is put on, I believe, by the Scheidler Business School. And uh, so they gave a pitch, these accelerator programs uh, that teach people a, bit of, uh, a lot about business and how to uh, promote their uh, idea. And uh, one of the things they have to do is make what they call a pitch deck. And so um, they have a fascinating idea and they brought a copy of their pitch deck to share with us. So uh, it's not gonna be death by PowerPoint by any means. So what we wanna do is uh, work our way through it and as uh, Jay said, when we started the program, this is a really fascinating business idea. So over to Lauren and uh, Spencer. So tell us all about real fresh fish. Yeah, thank you, Lauren and Spencer for coming on the show. Just to put it in perspective, <clears throat> this was in the, what is it? The Business Venture Competition at Scheidler. And yeah. you presented this program, this, this um, entrepreneurial idea and you won. Uh, in that program, am I right? I'm mean, yeah. going to the finals. We got third place. Okay. And this and this this venture that you're doing involves fresh fish. I could be wrong on some of my, my uh, extra, extrapolation here, but um, it seems like you get the fresh fish from the fishermen here in Hawaii Net directly. Okay. And then you you buy that and you resell it to consumers. And we're going to talk about exactly what that you know chain of custody is and how you manage that, but it sounds like a beautiful idea for exactly the right time. Uh, and gee whiz, I like to hear all about it. So tell us all about it. Yeah, th uh, thank you for having us. So our uh, basically the idea is just to give a, a platform to connect uh, the local small scale fishermen and and other producers directly to the consumers so they can buy the freshest fish possible. And uh, the idea kind of started through our own fishing adventures and uh, me being commercially licensed, trying to sell fish and seeing the, the avenues that I had to sell fish or lack thereof. And then just looking for ways to, to make it work as well as seeing like the, the amount of markup that you see in, in the stores from what the fishermen are, are getting for their fish to what it retails at in stores. There's really like a, a huge disconnect there. So we, we started brainstorming ideas to, to fix those problems. Well, it sounds to me like if you put the pieces together, the fisherman's a winner because now he has a market where the market's not so hot. Uh, restaurants are closing all over the place. I mean, closing permanently all over the place. Um, and the consumer is in better shape because he pays less for the lack of, of a middleman. And you become the middleman. Now, are you, are you buying on consignment? Are you buying, you know, the fish and then reselling it? Or are you just brokering it in some way, connecting the buyer and the consumer, the consumer buyer and the fisherman seller? Uh, which way is that working? How, how is the fish being, you know, handled? So it would be connecting fishermen directly with consumers and we would just be a platform to help facilitate that and so you can browse whatever fish is caught that day and you can eat it for dinner okay so that means software it means a pretty sophisticated website it's a what do you call it it's a it's, it's a it's a selling website 
that's an e-website kind of thing. So I go on there. I guess I have an account. I go on this website and I and I check out to see what fish, um, and I get uh, and I get to what deal directly with the fisherman, and the fisherman. Then I order the fish through the website. I guess I pay on the website, and a lot of fishermen are not going to have their own websites or their own means of payment. So I have to put my credit card on the website pay on the website, and then you will in turn turn that money over to the fishermen. And now, how did, this is a question Mitch had before the show. How does the fish then uh, get from the fishermen to the consumer? So yeah, that's basically it so far. Um, be able to facilitate payment would be a, a great service to both the uh, fishermen and the consumer. And then uh, they would be able to, to meet up and feel comfortable knowing that the fishermen are vetted and they could go to their house or to right to the dock and pick it up right then and there and be able to um, either process the payment through the website or handle cash in person or arrange for delivery through the fishermen themselves. A lot of fishermen are willing to deliver the fish or even just uh, the third party delivery app apps that are real common these days. Oh, like, like Uber or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. Um, so it can be any number of ways, but you, you don't actually handle the delivery. All you do is put them together. Is that right? Ideally not to keep the, the fish as fresh as possible and to keep it as affordable as possible, but maybe um, eventually down the line might have like uh, distribution centers or kind of like, like holding centers in theory to just to make it more convenient for people. Yeah, how do you how do you vet the uh, fisherman? I mean, what do you say to a fisherman? Is your fish fresh? I promise you, he'll tell you his fish is fresh. Yeah, how do so, you vet a fisherman? Yeah, a lot of fishermen. Uh, there's a bit of a stigma, but it's really not necessary. A lot of the fishermen know that they they try to take as good care of their fish as they can to to get the best prices for it. But also, we have certain guidelines that they have to certify to follow, as well as giving the consumer their own resources to to know what they're looking for and to be able to see that this fish is fresh and it was taken care of you can you can see it if you know what you're looking for now one of the structural issues i see in what you've presented is this if you put your buyer and your seller together the next time around your buyer and your seller can deal directly and cut you out how do you protect against that yeah, so ideally the, the trust in the platform and uh, and having it be efficient enough compared to the fishermen having to text 20, 30 people, they can just send out one mass thing and then they'll yeah. have that incentive to help them keep using it as and, well. Yeah, and the messages will be facilitated through our platform, Real Fresh. Yes, but suppose I'm a buyer. I really like the fish I got from Fisherman X, okay? <clears throat> and... Uh, I, I, have his, I have his contacts. I have his email or his phone or both. And I call him up after the deal and I say, you know, Mike, that was great fish there. I really appreciate that. And I'd like to order some more from you. <clears throat> and I want to do it on the side because I like to negotiate a price that's slightly lower. And no, we don't have to deal with real fresh. It's just you and me. I like you a lot. Why can't that happen? Don't you get cut out? And don't you lose your profit going forward? Yeah, so there's definitely the chance of like the platform leakage. So um, one thing to, to combat that issue specifically would just be the the convenience of the fisherman not wanting to deal with to text all his buyers initially, as well as that one fisherman may only fish once a week or once a once a month. So the the buyer would want to to stay on the platform to have access to other types of fish. As well. So you're assuming uh, small consumers. You're not assuming restaurants or hotels if we ever have hotels again. If I'm a big buyer, I'm going to try to cut you out. Sorry. So the question is, uh, I'm only suggesting that maybe you have to think about this uh, because, you know, the standard rule is don't don't get cut out. <laughs> you go to all this trouble and then somebody cuts you out. That's really mean. But it's possible. And it's not illegal unless unless you have a, a contract to, to that effect where you don't let them cut you out. The other thing is, uh, I, I told you before the show, I think it's a great idea, wonderful idea. It's, it's timely. It's right now. It, it wraps in COVID. It wraps in local fishermen. I mean, everybody's a winner in this deal. 
It's so much so that, you know, it, it, it shouts at you, why don't you do this too? Mitch, why don't you do this? Why don't I do this? Why don't I get some friends of mine to do this? This is so easy. All you got to do is go down to the docks and write some names on a yellow paper and make a website. And before you know it, you know, uh, you'll put uh, Lauren and Spencer out of business. Um, how do you protect your, your, your venture? Yeah, so one thing that's it's really hard to do with a platform like this is uh, it's real easy to enter, but it's, it's hard to scale. So uh, once we, we can't really create barriers to entry, but once we scale and, and get a bunch of people using the site, it'll be a lot harder for competitors to come in since they have to build up both the buyer and the fisherman side. And as well as just our industry connections in the fishing world, uh, I would imagine few people have as many uh, industry connections as we do. So just being able to onboard the fishermen like personally would be a, a great uh, well, have you ever thought about being exclusive? Do you think you have you could have the uh, negotiating position in the marketplace to be exclusive? Say to the fishermen, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to get you a lot of business. And assuming we get you the business we think we're going to get you, we want you to deal only through us. We don't want you to go around and cut us out. And we don't want you to deal with any other supplier. Mitch, is that legal? I think any kind of a business arrangement is legal. You're not restricting trade. I mean, you know, the guy has the... Uh, the option of saying yes or no. I mean, he's his, his own boss. So, but I'm not a lawyer like you. Jay. That's why. That's why I asked you. I wanted a completely non-legal, you know, response. Yeah. So, but you're going to have to see a lawyer about making an agreement. I don't think you can do this deal without having an agreement. You need an agreement with both sides. You are the hub of the wheel, and and the spokes lead out to your fishermen. You got to have an agreement with them, and spokes lead out, of course, to the consumer. And both of those both of those contracts are worth putting in some real thought and real time and maybe real money with a lawyer who can write them up proper and save you from the two risks that I identified. You know, on the other side, what's been the uptake from the fishermen? I mean, what's been your uh, experience so far with them? Um, do they view this as a valuable service? Do they want to sign up? Is this is this working? And and. How many fishermen have we got here in Hawaii? So what's kind of your market for us as far as, as, far as your supplier base goes? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of like, we've done a, a extensive amount of like um, market research and just from our industry knowledge as well, we kind of create two um, market segments. One is the long line fishery and then the other is everything else basically. So, um, just excluding the long liners at first, we're looking at about 1500 um, commercial licensed fishermen. Wow. Um, and then they estimate about double the amount of recreational fishermen as well. Um, that's just in Hawaii. Presumably you could do this anywhere. You could do this globally, I guess. Yes? Definitely. Yeah. You know, one issue is you got a lot of guys down there in the docks, you know, the ones who uh, you mentioned in your, we're gonna go to your slides in a minute. Um, you know, who, who make a living at the fish auctions at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, what are, what are they, how are they going to think about you? Are they going to like you? So this, the coronavirus thing has really flipped everything on its head. And before you'd never see those big long line boats selling directly from the dock. But lately with such little demand from the hotels and the restaurants, the auction has actually been turning away fishermen and saying, we won't take your fish. It's gonna, it's just gonna flood the market and drop the prices to nothing. So they've been selling right from the dock. So yeah, I think we could even open up that other customer segment to the long liners as well. Yeah, right, good thought, good thought. And we have this on tape also, you know. Okay, so let's talk about your slides. Um, why don't you call up some of your slides and, uh, and uh, let's see what you've got going, Spencer. Spencer, I assume you're the CEO, yeah? Correct. Okay, yeah. All right. And, and Lauren helps you in many ways, including being an a, what, executive vice president or something along those lines? Yes, I'm the CEO. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's talk about your slides. What do you want to look at? Okay. Um, yeah, we'll go to that. We'll jump into the first slide. Yes, yeah, kind of like our, uh, our little elevator pitch here that... Um, some statistics for people is that the, on average, uh, consumers can expect to see 30% lower prices than they do in grocery stores, sometimes more like 50 or even 100% um, savings. 
And then for the fishermen, they can see 200, even up to 1,000%. And these aren't just made up numbers. The other day I sold an ahi for about like $1.80 a pound. And then we walked over to Nico's and I saw 21.99 for a, a pound of ahi. Right. Wow. Yeah. Wow, there's a spread there, isn't there? Yep. As you can tell when you're trying to buy fish in stores, the selection is not the best. And you can tell that the fish is definitely not fresh. That's because the fish are actually at sea for a long time. Can you tell if a fish is, uh, or yeah, a cut of fish is fresh from a, a picture? Because, uh, you know, you see pictures. Uh, so I think the fish, the fish auctions show pictures, don't they? Somebody is showing pictures um, uh, are you going to be able to show pictures on your website? Yep, for sure. They'll be able to post pictures of their, their catch. They can take a picture with their cell phone, right? The fishermen can do that. And so send in, a, in a perfect world, the way it's going to work is the fishermen will finish their day of fishing, start heading back to the harbor, take some pictures of their catch and post it. And then the, he'll have 5, 10, 15 buyers waiting for him at the pier. That would be ideal scenario. Okay, but from time to time, you're going to go on the boat, right? You're going to go on the boat and see if it's uh, hygienic and see if they're doing what they say they're doing, right? Yeah, we plan to have like uh, certifications, make sure they're following certain procedures as well. Yeah, okay. Mitch? What are the signs that a fish is not fresh? So if you can see the whole thing, um, one of the big indicators is the eye, whether or not it's like cloudy or kind of like doesn't look quite right. And then just like the, the texture of it, if it's the whole fish itself is kind of like mushy, you can kind of right. see that it wasn't, uh, maybe either wasn't cold enough or it's pretty old. Right. So is the uh, follow on question, does the fisherman actually package the fish? I mean, he packs it in ice when he's out there fishing, but when he gets back and say, I only want a pound, he has to chop off a pound of fish. And uh, does he have his own containers? packs it in ice and then I guess uh, shuts the container down and gives it to you or does he uh, shrink wrap it or how, how's that part of it handled? So likely it'll be uh, Ziploc bags if people want to buy oh. uh, fillets <laughs> rather than the whole fish. Yeah. Or even um, we're looking into some like kind of proprietary packaging that we could use that people would uh, could benefit from. I guess well, the question of full. Go ahead. You can hand out baggies with your logo on it, right? Yeah. yeah. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, easy to do. Are, are, is there a fillet in, in, the, in the pipeline here? Um, is anybody going to get in the middle of that delivery system and, and fillet the fish for you? So it, as of now, we're planning to have like basically like a wholesale service where the fishermen can say, okay, I, I can cut this fish for you. Or like if you just want a fillet, I'll cut off a fillet for you. Oh, very good. And they'd be, if they're willing to do that, that helps because sure. it makes your market that much stronger. No. For sure. Uh, yeah. And from our experience, a lot of the fishermen are willing to do that. Yeah. And if you're talking about the small buyer, the small buyer is not in the mood to do the filet if you can get somebody to help them do that or you can get it delivered yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah. And we plan to mainly, our kind of target market would just be your everyday family, but we, we don't intend to like, uh, disqualify restaurants or hotels or anyone from using the site as well. Oh yeah, we kind of talked about these already, mainly like the um, just low prices wherever wherever they can sell their fish these days. So yeah, just kind of to give uh, another overview, just fisherman catches the fish, posts it on the website. The consumers who have signed up to be notified will get like a text message that said, this fish was just caught in your area if you want to meet it up, here's the price. And then they can either meet up and then pay through the website or pay cash. And so are, are you going to be on all islands? Are you, what do you plan? Yep, we're planning to launch on all the islands in Hawaii. And then hopefully if the, um, the idea works, basically ex expand the mainland and internationally. What's the name of the website? Real, realfresh.com? Realfresh. Well, we're working on a domain name, but um, most likely realfresh.com. Okay, uh, and Lauren, you're working on the website. Yes. Are you gonna Are you gonna include recipes? Yes, yes, for sure. We do plan to have recipes and other kind of how-to videos for consumers and fishermen alike. Yeah. yeah that's just kind of an illustration of our uh, our price differential from like the average wholesale 
auction price up to the retail price in stores. So are you going to negotiate the prices with the fishermen or just let them set the price? So yeah, we probably will have it so they can set whatever price they want. But we will have like resources for the fishermen, like a suggested retail price or like today's market price. And are you going to tell the consumer what you're paying or what the, the fisherman is charging? So yeah, it'll be kind of sort of like Craigslist where they, they go on that specific profile or that post and it'll say, here's a pound of ahi for $10 a pound. Here's a pound of mahi at, and each price for like a whole or filet, however they want to buy it. Okay, will the consumer be able to f figure out or will the fisherman be able to figure out what your cut is? Yeah, we're definitely still considering like different revenue models, but uh, either, we're working on either a commission or maybe a kind of like a membership fee to be on the website. Yeah, I think this is a great slide to really show the value proposition here, so. Yeah, you can see the savings for the buyers and the fishermen. And the fishermen would set the price at $15 or whichever price they want. But you can see it's a big difference if you're buying $21.99 at Foodland and they set the price to $15. That's a lot of savings. That's huge. You buy more than one pound of fish. Yeah. So savings against what, though? Because the market is really in, um, in the tank right now. So it's a savings against the historical cost, right? Well, even you see, it's funny, the, throughout the coronavirus, the, the ahi prices specifically at the wholesale level have fluctuated from the lowest lows to the highest highs. And what you've seen in the stores is pretty much almost the highest highs. Like it's still expensive in stores. Yeah, that picture from Foodland is from three weeks ago. Ah, okay. And uh, there is not a to discourage any other type of fishing, but that particular fish is most likely a long line fish. And by the time it hits the, the grocery store, it's probably three weeks old. And the real fresh fish was swimming that day. Suppose you get a call one day from a, 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 a Japanese market or a Japanese food wholesaler. And he, and he says to you, uh, Spencer, you know, we'd like to buy some of your fish. We love Hawaii fish. So can you freeze this and put it in dry ice and, and ship it off to us? Would, would you be able to expand your operation to include that? Yeah, we, we would love to facilitate something like that. Um, so these are some additional value propositions that we have other than the price savings. The methods of fishing that we would promote like from the small scale fishermen would have methods of less bycatch and it would help Hawaii be less dependent on imported goods as a whole. And that's pretty important these days. It also increase transparency where food, your food comes from, which is a big demand right now for consumers. Yeah, sustainability is everything. But you know, uh, Mitch, doesn't this remind you of the uh, the ahi uh, cage farm project that was off Kona, um, and uh, it failed. Um, but uh, it'll come back. I think uh, there was a little contention with the local fishermen uh, where somebody wanted to do uh, aquaculture ahi in a big cage um, and all kinds of technology for it. If it comes back, how can you click into that with with uh, real fresh? I think that we would mostly want to focus on wild caught um, ahi, but I don't see why there would be an exclusion as of right now for um, caged ahi. Yeah, okay. All right. So, uh, there's an organization over at Nelha now that you guys, I don't know if you've heard of Hatch, but they're an entrepreneurial group. They kind of do accelerators as well. Uh, and because Nelha has a, has a lot of uh, farm fish going on there, uh, aquaculture. So you might want to tap into them with your business model. And they're uh, global. They're out of Norway originally. So I highly recommend if you didn't know about them that you go and contact them. They're always looking for new cohorts, as they call it. And uh, I understand that they do have money. So uh, to, you know, promote the fisheries trade and they're experts in the fisheries trade. So you might want to look at, uh, look at that as another option for your uh, business model. So what's been the take up so far? I mean, you just started, have you just started this? Uh, have you had initial sales and how, how's it going? So yeah, we've, uh, we've been doing a bit of uh, 
apps, kind of like customer outreach surveys and things like that, trying to see whether or not we really want to push forward and, and go ahead with this. Uh, we've spoken to um, several developers and have kind of found the developer we've planned to go with if we can get the, the funds together. So what's, a develop, what's a developer yeah. uh, for this purpose? What so is a developer? A software developer. Mm. And like web designer to help us build the, the functionality of the site. Very important. That's Sorry, another Mitch. question I had. What, what other kinds of products could you sell besides fish? I mean, once you develop the, the app, the application, then there must be like the world's your oyster. You know, you could sell just about anything in, in this yeah. Did you say oyster? I thought you said oyster. I said oyster. That's, That's part what of it. said. Yeah. Yeah. I said oysters too. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we have kind of a bigger hopes for the, the website too in that like micro scale production, being able to have like, say you have a backyard, um, a mango tree or a little garden in your backyard or aquaponics, you'd be able to sell your excess to people in your immediate community, which would reduce like dependence on shipped goods and store-bought goods, so. Yeah, it would help Hawaii's food security. I would think the coffee industry might be an interesting target as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh any more slides you want to talk about or should we uh, go to the future yeah i think we're good to, to move on okay so you guys are doing only really, you know minimal sales right now you're developing contacts you're building a website hopefully you're going to build good contracts you need that um and uh where does it go from there i mean question i suppose is are you serious about this is this going to be a career for you is this going to be a company that you invest your time into and, and money and all the money your family will give you and your credit cards and everything <laughs> until you get some real capital? Yeah, we is, this, is this serious? Yeah, we're serious. We put a, a ton of time into it already and we plan to move forward. So next step, we're basically finalizing a few things as far as like user interface goes on the, on the website. And then we'll um, work on getting together some funds and then start developing the site. So what kind of funding are you projecting that you need? What's, what's the, as they say in the trade, what's the raise? Um, we, we try and do it very lean in the beginning, really do like a minimum viable product at first. So we're looking for about 20 to 30,000 to begin with. And we'll probably, it'll probably be like kind of pre-seed funding from family and friends most likely and then be able to kind of prove the concept and then hopefully attract some bigger investors and, and really improve the site. You're looking, aside from the developers and all that, and I suppose the lawyers with the contract, are you looking to hire anybody? And who, and wh who would that be and what would that person do? So yeah, we definitely be interested in, um, I've been talking to a few kind of people more on the technical side um, to help us with the, the development of the, the website. And then most likely um, some kind of in-house like accounting or financing as well. Someone who helps okay. us with that through that process. Yeah, this is a great play. It's a great play. It's a, a, certainly at the, at the beginning now, but it's a great play. And it's going to depend on all the elements we've talked about, how well you, you do the website and the e-commerce, um, how well you do the relations with the, the fishermen and the marketing with the consumers. I mean, all these things potentially are um, doable and doable well. And the market clearly is good for you. You, you pick the right moment, the right problem to solve. And furthermore, I mean, part of my basis for saying that is we're not done with COVID. We're not done with the trouble in the economy. We're not done with the failures of restaurants. Uh, things are changing all around. The one thing it's not changing is people like fish. They're going to insist on fish. It's going to be a staple, especially here. Okay, Mitch, you want to want to ask him any more questions or close up? How you want to deal with this now? I think I'm going to close up, but I just uh, want to give a plug for the University of Hawaii Office of Technology Transfer and the Scheidler Business School, who are helping our young entrepreneurs uh, enter uh, the uh, the perilous shark infested, no pun intended, waters of business. And it's uh, really good to see uh, you two guys have uh, are 
are getting in there, getting your feet wet or getting blooded, whatever you want to call it, and uh, getting out there with a really great uh, idea. And uh, I guess uh, we wish you all the best and keep us informed. And uh, when you got something new, come on back and talk to us about it and tell us how you're doing, what you learned in the hard, cruel world of business. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'd be interested in talking to you again. And I, and I, I would leave you with my comment is uh, something that, that Mitch said. It's uh, the world indeed is your, your oyster. There you go. Yeah, we'd like to thank our mentor, Mark Tawara, for, during the new expansion competition. OK. Yeah, and thank you guys for, for having us on here. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Lauren and, uh, and Spencer, really appreciate you coming on the show. And, and Mitch, of course, thank you so much for setting this up. Hey, Aloha, you guys. All right. Aloha. Aloha.